Hello and welcome to this video on coronavirus. Today is March 12th, 2020 and WHO, World Health Organization, has declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Now, COVID-19 in last one month or so has brought the world to its knees. So today we will talk all about COVID virus. However, I want to give some disclaimers. First of all, these are my personal views based on the current knowledge and facts. And remember, there's a lot we don't know about coronavirus yet. <clears throat> we will do this video in three sections. First, we will talk about what is coronavirus, who is at risk and so on. Second, we'll talk about what should we do about the coronavirus situation. And third, uh, why should we plan but not panic regarding coronavirus situation? First of all, we all need to understand that coronavirus or COVID-19 is a serious condition and is truly a pandemic now. So now what is pandemic? Pandemic is basically an epidemic of a worldwide proportion. Whereas epidemic is essentially an outbreak of a disease or a condition, which basically means a significant increase in the number over a wide geographical area, such as like a city, a state or a country. Um, this is not the first pandemic that we have seen. The last pandemic I remember was 2009, uh, which was a swine flu pandemic, which affected many countries. Now, COVID-19 is a new type of coronavirus. Coronavirus, on, a, on the other hand, is a very common family of viruses that probably has affected you and me at some point of our life. It's a common respiratory virus which generally causes common cold. However, COVID-19 is a new kid in this family. COVID-19 first surfaced in Wuhan, China at the end of 2019 probably from an animal source which jump the virus jumped from an animal source to the human and now it's leading to human to human transmission as well now note that SARS which is severe acute respiratory syndrome and MERS which is middle east respiratory syndrome were also coronaviruses which jumped from animal to human and led to epidemic in several parts of the world in early 2000s. So what makes COVID-19 so special and deadly? It's the sheer speed by which it has spread to more than 100 countries in the matter of few months. That's what makes this virus really special and problematic for us. The symptom of COVID-19 appears 2 to 14 days after the exposure and symptom typically includes fever, cough, or difficulty in breathing. Fortunately, most of the patients would have very mild infection, almost 80% of the patients. As you can see in this graph, most patients would have a mild symptom of almost like having a mild flu. Uh, and many patients would not even know that they have or have had this infection because they will recover without any consequences. But the problem is that 15% of the patients get really sick, requiring medical attention, including hospitalization. And amongst them, 5% of the patients actually require ICU care for a prolonged period of time. And about 1-2% to 2 worldwide have, may die from this disease. Next, I will show you some graphs on case fertility rate. Case fertility rate is very important. It basically means the proportion of death amongst the total number of patients affected. On an average, the case fertility rate, that means the percentage of patients who may die from this disease is about one to 2% worldwide. As shown on this graph, we can see that there is a list of countries on the left side, followed by the number of cases affected in each country, followed by the number of death, and then the overall case fertility rate. That means the percentage of patients who may die if they have this infection. As you can see, the worst affected is China, followed by Italy, Iran, and South Korea. Then you can see several European countries are affected. And then US is on the list to be the most affected after European countries. <clears throat> As of now, as you can see, the case fertility rate 
in US is about 3%. That means 30 plus patients have died amongst the thousand affected in US. Now US population is more than 300 million. At thousand plus cases, we are talking about an overall risk of infection about five or less than five per million population. So it seems like it's a very low risk of a particular patient to be infected. However, the problem is that the risk is rising rapidly. Now let's talk about those two to three percent patients who are at risk of dying if they are infected by COVID-19. As you can see in this graph, the age is represented on x-axis and the percentage of death are given by these bars. As you can see, elderly patients have the highest risk. Generally, above 60 years of age, you have the much higher risk as compared to below 60 years of age. That does not mean that the patients are not getting infected and dying less than 60 years of age. That surely can happen. However, the risk is much less as compared to age group of 60 plus. And even on 60 plus age group, higher the age, the higher the risk. So 70 plus years patients have much higher risk and then 80 years plus patients have a lot more risk from dying from COVID-19 if they get infected. Now, this is because as we age, our immune system weakens. And also over the years, we accumulate more and more disease, what we call as comorbid conditions. Um, and all of this weakens our ability to fight infection. Fortunately, this virus infection is rather mild in kids. In kids, there are almost no deaths reported from this virus so far. However, kids can transmit the infection to their grandparents or their uncle and aunties when they meet them. And so that's why it's also important to protect the kids against this infection. Apart from elderly, as you can see in this graph, patients with other medical conditions are also at high risk particularly patients with heart disease, such as congestive heart failure or coronary artery disease, patients with diabetes, or patients with chronic lung conditions, such as COPD, asthma, or lung fibrosis, as well as patients who have underlying cancer and high blood pressure as problems are also at high risk from this disease. <clears throat> the reason these conditions are high risk is because it weakens our body's ability to fight or body's response against the infection. Now I want to talk about another high risk categories of patients, which this graph does not talk about, which is patients who are immune compromised, such as patients who have had transplant or um, patients who have autoimmune diseases and they are on immune suppressive drugs, such as steroids like prednisone or uh, oral drugs such as methotrexate mycophenolate, azathioprine, and so on, or patients who are on biological drugs, such as uh, drugs like Humira, Embril, uh, drugs like Zalgens, and so on. So, so far we discussed some high risk groups, which are at high risk of death or bad outcome if they have this infection. However, we discussed that the risk of infection overall is rather low. So who are the patients or people who are at high risk of getting this infection in the, at the first place? The highest risk of people who can get this infection are actually close contacts or family members of patients with COVID-19 and healthcare workers taking care of the patients with COVID-19. Those are at the highest risk and also close contacts of or people who are returning from foreign destinations, which has shown a peak or a significant increase in the cases such as China, Korea, Italy, Iran, and now Europe. After giving this introduction on coronavirus or COVID-19 specifically, we will talk about what should we do about this situation of COVID-19. First, how does the virus spread? It spreads from person to person if you come in close contact with an infected person within three to five, six feet of an infected person by the way of normal speaking, you can get the infection from an infected person. 
or if the infected person cough or sneeze in front of you, then you can get infected as the virus would be carried by those droplets. Another way this virus can spread is if a person touches uh, an object or a surface which contains the virus and then touches his or her mouth, uh, nose or eyes. And that could be another way of transmission of this disease. Let's now discuss what should people do? Well, first of all, everyone, regardless of their level of risk, should use basic precautions of infection, which starts from proper hand washing and obviously clearing the webs of the, of the hands as well and washing for at least 20 seconds or using hand sanitizers frequently. I would recommend to keep one hand sanitizer like this pocket size in your pocket, one at your home or the entrance of your home or office, and as well as one in your car and use it frequently. <clears throat> Second, cough or sneeze in a disposable tissue and discard it in a closed bin. And only use your elbow if you have no tissue available at that point. So using the elbow is a good thing, but it's not as good as using a tissue and disposing it off. The reason is when we use the elbow, we are actually infecting our own clothes and that can become source of infection then. Third, absolutely no handshake. Now people are recommending fist bump or the elbow bump. However, as you can see in this graph, even the fist bump and the elbow bump can lead to infection. It's better to have a no contact way of greeting such as namaste or using a simple bow or just simply a hi would do fine. Fourth is if you yourself are sick, then stay at home, quarantine yourself and seek medical advice and attention as soon as possible. And also to avoid anyone who is sick, so avoid meeting anyone who is sick. So avoid any kind of sick contacts at all. And fifth is to avoid travel to places or cities with large number of cases where there clearly has been an outbreak, whether it's within US or international travel. And the sixth preventive measure that you can take is avoid touching your face, your eyes or nose with your hands. However, it is very difficult for most people because it's very natural for you to touch your face, nose or eyes during uh, several times during the day. In fact, most people don't even know they do that several times during the day. <clears throat> the seventh point is use mask only if you're sick or you are in a close contact of a sick known person. The reason is mask should be used by healthcare professional and other in contact with sick people. If everybody start using masks, we will have a significant shortage of masks in the country and the people who really need to use the mask will not be able to use the mask. Now, next we will discuss what should high risk patients do? Now, this is a very difficult question that I get asked all the time. It's fine to give recommendation to our, for general population, but what should specifically a high risk patient do in their day to day life? So let's just first discuss who are these high risk groups. There are four high risk groups. One is by age, simply patients who's above 60 years of age and more importantly, who's above 70 and 80 years of age. The second high risk group is patients with comorbid conditions such as heart disease, lung disease, or having diabetes, having underlying cancer, uh, hyper, uh, high blood pressure, and so on. The third is, are the patients who are on immune suppressive drugs for various reasons, whether it's an autoimmune disease or from their uh, other underlying conditions. These immune suppressive drugs weakens your immunity, so it weakens your ability to fight the infection. And the fourth risk is the patients who are in contact, who have been in contact uh, with COVID-19 uh, patients or COVID-19 uh, family members, and also patients who have been at an area which has been high risk for COVID-19, such as Italy, Iran, China, South Korea, and now Europe. <clears throat> now these high risk patients should take extra precautions, like pretty much avoiding any non-essential travel, avoiding any sick contacts or 
meet, uh, avoiding crowded places, avoiding meeting a lot of people in a day and so on. Another question that I get commonly asked is if I have none of these risk factors, what should I do about travel? Well, again, you have to weigh the risk versus benefit. The benefit of travel would be to places where you're going. How important is that travel for you? What event are you trying to attend or what meeting are you trying to, uh, to attend? Can it be done remotely or not? And so on. So that event is your benefit or the meeting or the place that you're going is your benefit. Are you going to meet your uh, family members? Are you going for a wedding and so on? Um, and also then you have to weigh the risk of going to that place. The risk is can be easily determined by knowing the number of cases or the knowing the number of uh, outbreaks in that particular area or the city that you're visiting. Typically, it's easy to find out how many cases that happen in that particular city or district or community which you're trying to visit by going to their health department website. After determining their benefit versus risk, each individual person has to make the decision on their own, knowing all the risk and benefit that involves their travel. Last but not the least, I want to clarify that there is currently no particular drug or the treatment for this virus. In fact, the main treatment is what we call a supportive care by a trained medical professional such as your primary care doctor or if you're sicker, then by having hospitalization and so on. Also, don't wait for the vaccine. Vaccine will not be ready for you to use in near future and also may not affect this outbreak at all. It may be developed in several months to a year or so, but that will help future transmission or future spread of infection, but not this current one. Only preventive measures can help this one. It is my humble appeal to plan, not panic, to use facts, not fear, to respond to the situation rather than being reactionary and be think about your community and, and your fellow citizens as compared to being selfish. With this, I would like to end this video here and thank you very much for listening.